Welcome to uh, Samaritan's Purse uh, International Health Forum. I appreciate y'all coming this afternoon. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Jim Falks, uh, who is a renowned, uh, world-renowned expert on uh, African sleeping sickness, uh, was scheduled to speak today, but unfortunately due to a family emergency, he could not be with us. So on his behalf, I am going to be speaking alternatively, as you can see from the, uh, the, from the screen, about schistosomiasis. And this is uh, really the reason why I selected schistosomiasis is because of our recent deployment to the Philippines. Uh, Schistosoma japonicum is endemic in that region of the world. And so we dealt with it on a first-hand basis. And so with that, we felt it uh, uh, prudent to, uh, to address this topic matter. So, uh, and, and let me also um, say before I get started, uh, as you can see uh, there on the screen, uh, we worked in conjunction uh, and appropriate to this topic, uh, we worked in conjunction with Schistosomiasis Control and Research Hospital, and they really are world authorities uh, with regard to this uh, uh, very uh, important uh, disease. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, for you all that don't know what I look like, there I am. Um, let me also just start off with uh, my father was going to join us today, but uh, he, uh, uh, because of uh, some uh, pre-scheduled uh, appointment, he cannot join us. But uh, I um, told him that I would uh, dedicate this talk uh, to uh, his uh, friend. His uh, best friend is uh, Eugene McJunk, and he was a professor at UNC Chapel Hill and um, was a world authority on schistosomiasis and uh, so uh, this is in honor of, of him. I wish I had had a picture to accompany um, this uh, slide that I could not find one. Um, but uh, he is, um, as I did a literature search uh, back in the 90s, if you go back to the 1970s and 80s, his name is all over uh, research with regard to uh, schistosomiasis. <clears throat> and then also I wanted to uh, dedicate this, uh, this uh, talk of uh, the Schistosomiasis Hospital, and there's much of the staff in front of the emergency room there. And um, I owe a lot of what I know about this disease now to uh, these people in this picture. So we're very indebted to them. So with that, and, and um, Tom and, and whoever, uh, you know, please feel free to uh, speak in uh, to uh, this topic matter as, uh, uh, as you feel uh, so led. So it's, uh, you'll hear it uh, referred to as snail fever, uh, also in honor of uh, the uh, discoverer. Um, it's called bilharziasis. Uh, it was discovered in 1851 by a ger uh, German surgeon, um, uh, Dr. Ted Bilharz. Uh, he was actually in Egypt, and uh, he made the discovery uh, because uh, he noted many patients with this hematuria, blood in the urine, and uh, as you all well know, one of the um, subtypes of uh, schistosomiasis is uh, schistosoma hematobium, which uh, affects predominantly the uh, GU system and causes hematuria. So uh, he is uh, touted with discovering uh, this illness. Um, the uh, illness is caused by a parasite. Uh, they're referred to sometimes as, as flukes, or you also, in the, in the scientific literature, they'll be referred to as trematodes. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, they're also referred to as schistosomes. And this uh, uh, illness is, really has incredible morbidity and mortality. Um, the, uh, it, it is associated largely with a chronic infection, and so it's not uh, a, a real acute um, uh, high mortality rate, but over the years there can be many, many complications that can eventually lead to mortality, and it certainly leads to significant morbidity. In fact, um, if you look at the literature, it states that it, with regard to uh, socioeconomic impact, it's second only to malaria worldwide. So this is not a, a small illness, so it's very pertinent for us to discuss it here at International Health Forum. Um, in terms of the epidemiology, the prevalence um, worldwide um, about 200 million persons uh, are thought to be carrying this disease. So again, staggering numbers. Um, and then, uh, or you can look at it worldwide, one in 30 persons, uh, one in 30 persons 
uh, have this uh, disease worldwide. In regard to mortality, it's estimated that about 200,000 persons die um, secondary to the complications of schistosomiasis. And as we go through this uh, discussion, we'll learn what are some of the, the um, causes of mortality. Predominantly, um, with long-term infection, you can get neurological complications. Uh, these people will have recurrent seizure disorder that are difficult to, to treat. It can cause liver failure. They can get cirrhosis and ascites, and uh, we saw a good bit of that uh, in, the, in the Philippines. That's a, a significant problem. Uh, it can uh, infect the lungs and cause respiratory uh, illness. So there's a lot of variations of, of morbidity that uh, one can see. Uh, it's a very regionally um, directed illness. Uh, predominantly, we'll see it in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of Africa, South America, the Caribbean. Uh, and then Asia, um, and it largely has to do with um, where this, uh, the, the intermediate host is located, uh, the snail, as we'll learn, is, is the intermediate host. So it really is very contingent on um, the habitat of the snail itself. Um, <coughs> so to start off with, uh, a very relevant question might be, you know, how do you acquire this disease? When I think when we first went over there, we responded to uh, Typhoon uh, Haiyan in the Philippines. A lot of us uh, perhaps were naive as to how one might acquire the illness. And in fact, right now, we are um, doing some investigation uh, with some of our first responders uh, to make sure that indeed they did not acquire this disease because of the long-term implications. But as you can see from this picture right uh, here, it's very easily acquired through contact with fresh water in endemic regions. And that is because, again, that's where the, uh, the snail resides. Um, in, in this particular case with uh, Schistosoma japonicum, which is the particular type of Schistosomiasis that is endemic in the Philippines, its intermediate uh, host um, is uh, Onco uh, millennia quadrati, uh, which is just a, a scientific name for this small snail that's not any bigger than a grain of rice. And as you see this <coughs> woman and her child, they're cleaning their clothes, that water very likely could be literally have thousands and thousands of these little snails that uh, are transmitting uh, this, uh, this uh, fluke, this parasite, that can penetrate the skin in a moment. But other persons that are very susceptible to farmers, like especially rice, uh, uh, farmers are, are very susceptible to it as the rice uh, fields um, after a heavy rain will have uh, uh, significant uh, water puddles that they walk through. Uh, perhaps they just have sandals on and, and it literally it only takes seconds to penetrate the skin. So um, people in agriculture, people that are, you know, uh, women and children uh, that are, you know, cleansing or, or acquiring water to drink. Um, kids are very, very susceptible as they, uh, as you imagine, uh, they play in the water quite frequently, and so uh, we'll see that, uh, uh, in fact, the incidence uh, steadily rises in children up to about age 20. But in, in summary, it's uh, contact with fresh water that contains these snails. <coughs> so with that, uh, after one acquires uh, the infection, uh, the natural um, uh, next step is to consider its life cycle. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, take a look at that, exactly how that happens. This next slide here is an uh, animated slide of the life cycle. It's relatively complex, but we'll just start off with, uh, again, um, uh, it's, a, it's a trematode. And trematodes, they often have a uh, a life cycle that involves an intermediate host and an invertebrate, and then it has a, the permanent host is the vertebrate, and in this case it's humans. But let me point out that these um, uh, can infect numerous animals too, and they're part of uh, what perpetuates the illness in these endemic countries. Many of the uh, uh, animals uh, that are out and about um, can transmit uh, the, um, through defecation, can transmit uh, uh, the illness. But let's, uh, uh, looking at this um, uh, schematic here, you see this, this uh, person here, and uh, they're infected with uh, schistosomiasis. And so 
uh, if they defecate into, and, and that stool does um, make contact with the water, um, it has thousands of eggs. Uh, japonicum, uh, Schistosoma japonicum, in fact, they say daily it can release about up to 3,500, 3,500 eggs per day. So, uh, per worm. Exactly, that's per worm. So, it's, this is, and, 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 and these people have multiple flukes or worms. So, it's a, an enormous um, a burden. And japonicum is actually the most contagious of all the, the, the various schistosomes. When the egg makes contact with the, the water, um, it, is, uh, it, it immediately releases uh, what are called um, uh, mericidia. And they have male and female mericidia. And uh, these uh, mericidia very, uh, and these are a premature larva uh, of, this, uh, of this worm. And it, it, it quickly is looking for its intermediate host, the snail. And as soon as it finds the snail, it, it, it actually can penetrate the snail via the foot, the, 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 I guess it's sort of the, 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 the tail end of the snail, it's called the foot. And uh, there, the, um, through uh, asexual reproduction, the male and the female, mericidia, um, um, there's, it's, uh, again, asexual reproduction, but, but they uh, give rise to um, uh, uh, advan more advanced larval stages that eventually become what are called cercaria. And these cercaria are then released uh, out into the water. Uh, and, and if you can see in this schematic here, let me uh, grab a pointer here. Uh, oops, just a second. Um, if you'll see right here, uh, these are called cercaria, and these are a more advanced larval form of the um, schistosomiasis, uh, and they have this bifurcated tail. They look a little bit like fish. Well, they are ideal for uh, penetrating um, human skin. They can do it again in a matter of, uh, of seconds. Um, so, um, so when the uh, innocent bystander, the host, uh, is swimming in the, or, uh, in the water, uh, such as a child or the farmer is, is um, working in his uh, rice uh, field, uh, these cercaria can penetrate the skin. And then they uh, make way to the venous system. They have these uh, proteolytic enzymes that basically uh, enable them to penetrate into the, to the venous system. And then from there, they make their way into the, the lungs and then eventually out uh, to the, uh, out, or pumped out through the heart. And then they, are, um, uh, they uh, make their way to the liver. And that's where they, uh, they mature in the liver. And that's where they actually um, uh, undergo um, they, they um, the male and female um, uh, uh, join together there, and then they, depending on what subtype of um, schistosome uh, somiasis or what subtype of schistosome it is, it makes way to its permanent residence. In the case of Japonicum, it lives in the small intestine of the human. So the male and the female um, uh, together, they um, uh, go down to, into the venous system, and um, that's where they live for life. Um, yeah, there's, uh, the three most common types is there's um, Japonicum, which lives in the small intestine, then there's Mansani, which lives predominantly in the large intestine, and then there's Hematobium, which lives adjacent to the bladder. Um, so that's where they reside for life, and these worms can live up to 30 years uh, in a human uh, person, and it may be, uh, the person may be completely asymptomatic, um, or they may develop the complications, which we've already alluded to. Um, so uh, these can uh, reside in the human body for quite some time, and that's a, that's a little bit disturbing uh, to me <laughs> to think that uh, you could, uh, you know, that you could be uh, a host to uh, a parasite for that that long a time. And, and again, um, a number of us, when we deployed to the Philippines, um, this was after the typhoon, and so there was extensive flooding. Uh, there was a huge uh, storm surge, uh, so a lot of us were exposed to this water, and so. Uh, we're going to undergo testing uh, to ensure that we weren't, in fact, uh, infected with this parasite. And we'll discuss that in a little while. But that's the essence of the life cycle. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Please feel free to ask any questions or make any comments. And a couple things. One is the cercaria or uh, phototrophic, uh, which, you know, you wonder how they find a host when it's not by accident that they do. Uh, uh, rice farmers in the farm field, anything else, but if you have these in, in water and you pass your hand between in the water, in between them and the light, 
they will actually orient and swim towards where the shadow went. Because so they, they, they will actually pursue, you know, the, their adult hosts. So the Securia, they are very, very fast swimmers. And uh, once they come in contact with human skin, they shed that tail immediately. Right. And ten seconds later, they have penetrated into, you know, into the body. So, you know, uh, we tell people, we've told people that were went to the Philippines that you didn't have to wade in the water. All you had to do is be splashed by it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and two have become exposed. Mm -hmm. Does it affect, you said it affects other animals too, like, yeah. fish, like fish or Not water? Not fish, right? warm water, warm, warm blooded animals. Yeah. And actually, Tom, do you know? Uh, I honestly, I, I'm not sure um, of uh, the very. There is, it's numerous. I mean, like uh, I read up to 30, but I honestly, I can't recall what. Uh, I don't know. I don't. Um, so I was wondering, like, if there's human zoochardama. Yeah. yeah, but uh, I was wondering if even like, uh, like even domestic animals like dogs um, could could. Uh, because there were so many hogs in the right. Philippines, it was unbelievable. But um, I, I don't know that answer. Um, so that's a great question. I, uh, I need to look into that. There used to be missionaries in uh, Lake Victoria, near Lake Victoria that would go out far from the shore and think they could go swimming and not not get to worry about it. Yeah, they they do hang out near the vegetation on the shoreline. So, and you know, I've I've had birch just though, which is a Mm -hmm. Different. It did not develop to the adult, but you sure get the sacarial penetration. You yeah. get der uh, the sacarial dermatitis, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, it's funny. It's it's in about the top six inches of the water where they 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 are found, and so if you're getting in and out of the water, then they're going to be dispersed generally on your body. But if you're down in the water at a certain level and stay there for a while. You'll have a band of, you know, wherever the water level was on you where they penetrate. Mm -hmm. So if you get your whole body six inches below the surface, you're fine. You're, <laughs> you're, you're in good shape. You, you know, know, what you said about the, they can live 30 years, just a side note, is that means that one adult female can lay 38 million eggs into your system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're very, yeah, very uh, infectious. Um, so just as a sort of a side note there, I don't know if um, if you all um, recognize that gentleman in the middle there. That's myself on the left there, um, and then uh, that's Dr. John Potts who was responded on the first team. And then um, uh, the honorary member of our medical team in the middle, that's Brady Rose. And uh, he uh, wrote the song, uh, the Schistus Femiasis song. So if you're bored one day, um, go Google Brady Rose, uh, the Shista Samiasa song on YouTube, and uh, it's an amazing song. It, it, <laughs> you'll learn, you'll remember more listening to his song, you'll learn more about Shista Samiasa than you will during this uh, this lecture because it's so memorable and so uh, uh, catchy. But um, anyway, he wrote an incredible song about Shista Samiasa there. So, um, as I said, the intermediate host is the snail, and hence uh, it gets its uh, slang name, uh, snail fever. Um, and, uh, you know, before I really uh, learned a lot about schistosomiasis, I assumed that the snail was, you know, quarter size or at least nickel size. And I was stunned to, uh, I, I actually saw them firsthand, but here's a good um, descriptive here. You see that penny there, um, just to give you an idea. Again, these uh, Oncomillenia quadrosi, which are the unique snail uh, that are the intermediate host of uh, Schistosoma japonicum, they're no bigger than a grain of rice. So they are incredibly small. Um, it's amazing that all this that we just discussed can take place in this uh, little snail, no bigger than a grain of rice. And that's as big as they are. So. Um, yeah, the other two species of, you know, uh, Schistosoma mansoni uses a snail called Biamphalaria. Uh, that's the one that's, that's the helical uh, one that in the picture you had on before that. And then uh, Hematobium uses Bolinus, which is the picture of the, the, the snail that was on the left. Okay. As the, it's not all the same. There's, there's going to be a quiz on those snail right. names that you guys <laughs> Very good. Um, so, um, with that, I just wanted to look at some, some facts about schistosomiasis. Um, what's really important to remember is that the majority of individuals uh, infected with uh, schistosomes are asymptomatic. So, um, 
in, in fact, you can like you can carry as a, uh, again you can carry these worms for years and never potentially have any sequelae or any side you know uh, characteristics of the disease and still you still carry them. However, after years, you can develop complications uh, from it, some very serious complications. So that's why, again, uh, if you uh, are exposed to fresh water in an endemic area, it's important uh, that you are um, tested to make sure that you, you don't have uh, schistosomiasis. Um, as Tom has already alluded to, um, uh, he talked about swimmer's itch and um, uh, expats or travelers they're very susceptible to swimmer's itch, and, and what that is, and we'll, we'll look at some pictures a little bit later on, but that's uh, literally, it's a rash uh, that's secondary to the penetration uh, of these uh, larvae, the cercaria uh, of the, uh, the schistosomes that penetrate your skin, and they leave these uh, very pyritic, um, uh, these little maculopapular um, spots, or just little, uh, other, in other words, just little red spots um, in, in, a, in a, the area that they penetrated your skin. And um, it's, uh, again, referred to as a swimmer's itch because naturally after you go swimming, you get this, again, very pyritic rash. Um, uh, uh, Expatriates uh, are also very susceptible to what's called Keisayama fever. Um, um, Keisayama fever, it's really a bit like a, a serum sickness. Um, it's largely, it, it's predominantly not from the, uh, the worm itself, but it's from the immune reaction of the host. And um, uh, these eggs um, that are released acutely into an, uh, a traveler that's never uh, been exposed to them before, it really uh, causes, uh, these eggs cause a, a, a hyperimmune reaction. Um, these people uh, can get sick very uh, quickly. It'll take several weeks after the exposure for it to happen because, again, they have to go through that life cycle process where they finally uh, take residence. Uh, in the case of japonicum, they take residence in the small intestine and they start releasing just thousands of these eggs. And these eggs are, can be released uh, throughout the body. And again, they really stimulate the immune system. And so these patients uh, with Keisayama fever um, they will get uh, high fever, as the name implies. Um, they can get um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, cough, and then just really general malaise. So it's sort of a, it really can be a very vague um, type of syndrome. I mean, how many diseases uh, or illnesses fit that uh, description? Um, you know, it could look, uh, mimic uh, just a gastrointestinal illness. Or, and um, I recall a number of our uh, uh, staff that had a gastro, you know, a, a, a bug, if you will, and, you know, perhaps it could have been k Tayama fever. But, again, the, the take-home message here is that um, persons that are, um, uh, that are not uh, indigenous to the community, uh, travelers or expats, when they are first exposed, they're most, uh, they're most susceptible to this k Tayama fever. The, the Filipinos are the persons that live in the, in the, you know, that grew up in that region. They are not so susceptible to Keisayama fever, but rather um, they are susceptible to the chronic complications, uh, such as the uh, cirrhosis of the liver that I described, or neurological um, schistosomiasis. And that's because over the years, they just keep getting re-exposed, re-exposed, re-exposed. And so they have a very, very high chronic parasitic burden. And, uh, and that is what eventually causes, uh, eventually it causes sort of, we'll talk about in a second, a granulomatous reaction or scarring in the liver and in the, in the brain. And hence, you can get the ascites and liver failure. You can get the seizure disorder. We saw many patients with seizure disorder uh, when we were in the Philippines, and it was almost assuredly uh, secondary to schistosomiasis. Can I ask, how long does the, uh, ra the rash and the fever last if you have an acute, like, mm -hmm. will it go away but you still have it, or, I mean? You can, um, uh, oftentimes, you can, you know, clear the illness, but you may not. Um, again, it can lie dormant for, for years. Um, I know of, just, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I know of one uh, case where a gentleman, um, he visited um, Lake Victoria in Kenya, um, and uh, had totally forgotten about this trip, and it was literally a decade later, uh, he developed a seizure disorder, and they did a CT scan here in the States, 
and they saw this big mass, and they thought it was the primary um, a brain tumor. And so he went to surgery and had it removed, and to their amazement when they did uh, the pathology on it, anticipating that it was going to be a, you know, a, a malignancy, uh, a, a, a primary brain tumor, it was actually, it was, uh, it was granulomatous scar tissue from schistosomiasis. And so that was, uh, he had gone 10 years asymptomatic, and apparently never got a, a bit, maybe he did get a, you know, Kekayama fever and um, but that cleared, but it he cleared, still had the but he still had the, the flukes mm -hmm. hanging out in his uh, intestine and giving off these eggs that eventually deposited um, in his brain and, and caused this uh, large scar tissue development and mass. Yeah, the skin lesions from the penetration are a T cell response. It's a cellular immune response, and it's seven to 14 days post exposure, mm -hmm. day, you know. And then you'll have that dark, you know, purple area where it heals for several weeks. Yeah, and then it, but then it, yeah, it goes away. Yeah, it's, right. it's a very transient illness. Yeah, yeah it's a very transient illness. <clears throat> um, and then I just made comment there that uh, in endemic regions, uh, it's, it's predominantly acquired in childhood, so the uh, prevalence and incidence peaks at about age 20 because, and, and they, it's a number of reasons, but I think predominantly it's just because the kids are getting exposed into the, you know, to the water over and over and over again. Um, so there, I just uh, kind of got ahead of myself there. So as I said, the prevalence uh, and the intensity of infection rises with age and peaks at age, about age 15 to 20. Um, it's more common in, in rural than urban areas, um, although it's becoming progressively more common in urban areas. Um, but again, I think that's predominantly just because, you know, in the rural areas is where you have exposures to lakes, rivers, agriculture, like rice fields, and so forth. And, and it's fresh water, not salt water. It is fresh water, yet the snails can't survive. Yeah, and the Ancomalina are amphibious. That means they live right at the edge of the water, you know, and they can, that's the reason they can survive in rice paddies, because the rice paddy will go dry and they just penetrate into the mud and wait until the next flood to come out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so it, it, in most areas, it's about, I think, uh, you estimate that about 5 to 10 percent of the population uh, carries a heavy burden of infection of parasites, um, and 90 to 95 percent of the population only has mild or moderate infection. And again, that has a lot to do with uh, the distribution of water. The people that are uh, either their profession or their, um, you know, or, or their uh, activities bring them in contact with the water, and they're the ones that. Uh, uh, generally have the uh, high uh, intensity of infection. <clears throat> so with that, let's just take a look at some of the morbidity, um, a little bit more uh, into the morbidity. What are the, you know, the side effects? And I've mentioned some of the more serious side effects, but, uh, but there's some uh, maybe not uh, so serious, but certainly still very, very problematic and can certainly cause um, a significant morbidity. Um, it certainly can lead to anemia. I haven't to re even alluded to this yet, but uh, for example, japonicum, as I said, the, the adult flukes, uh, they make residence uh, in the small intestine. And associated with that, there's a lot of um, scarring and, and ulceration and bleeding. So these uh, persons can have uh, chronic GI bleeding. Uh, they can get, you know, they can get uh, uh, a, a diseased uh, colon and, and have real problems and become very anemic, iron deficiency anemia, and I imagine B12 anemia as well. In association with that, certainly they can get chronic abdominal pain. Again, they can get concomitant liver disease. Um, they can get chronic diarrhea with or without bleeding, um, often with. Um, they can develop certainly uh, congestive heart failure and exercise intolerance. And, as I said, you can get um, um, pulmonary disease, and so that uh, can cause right-sided heart failure. And a lot of these people, like I remember um, seeing a lot of these people with massive varicosities, these huge varicose veins, and a lot of that is because either from like portal hypertension or even right-sided heart failure uh, because they have such high pressure in their lungs uh, from chronic infection and scarring uh, that they develop right-sided heart failure. So. Um, and then certainly associated with that, they, they are very short of breath, they can't um, exercise and engage in, in activities like you and I can. Uh, as I already said, they can get portal hypertension from the scarring in their, um, in their, their liver. Um, classically, they get uh, this 
um, scarring. It's uh, called. Uh, what is it called? It's called uh, um, pipe stem fibrosis, um, or Simmers fibrosis is, is what it's called. But they get this uh, significant scarring in their um, in the uh, venous system uh, of their uh, liver. Um, it actually doesn't cause direct infection of the liver cells themselves. So um, you may not see a, a, a real significant in inflammatory process like the AST, ALC may not be substantially elevated, um, but eventually they do go on to develop a um, scarring in the venous system of the liver and, uh, and then portal hypertension. Certainly, as I already alluded to, too, you can imagine with this um, significant GI disease, they can have malabsorption problems um, because, again, their residence is in the small intestine where you absorb a lot of nutrients. And so um, there's anemia and uh, significant malnutrition. So, so it's not a small issue. It contributes to uh, uh, significant uh, malnutrition in developing countries. And then I've already um, commented quite a bit about um, uh, CNS complications. I didn't mention there's um, certain you can get in, um, in infection. Sometimes usually the predominant problem is usually the eggs, but occasionally you will get um, uh, abnormal migration of the fluke, and they can actually um, migrate into the uh, um, the blood supply uh, in the uh, in the spinal cord um, or the brainstem, and, and be associated with paralysis. Uh, so you can even get paralysis from schistosomiasis. Um, and then um, we haven't talked much about it, but uh, bladder cancer. So in, uh, this is unique to uh, schistosoma uh, hematobium. Um, which is not in the Philippines, um, but uh, with chronic infection in the bladder, eventually you'll get a, a, a bladder cancer. And it's not the transitional cell carcinoma that we are accustomed to seeing in the States, um, but this is a squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. Uh, and that's very, very uh, common with chronic uh, bladder infection from hematobium. Any, anything else before we go on there? Any other comments or questions about morbidity? So you can see, you know, I said it's, um, it's second only to malaria worldwide in terms of socioeconomic impact. And, and um, with the, the, you know, we, we uh, looked at the epidemiology uh, profile too. I mean, it infects many, many people around the world. So, you know, I know usually when you say schistosomiasis to somebody, they look at you, you know, kind of funny. They, they don't do that with malaria. I think malaria has a lot more recognition, but uh, perhaps this should maybe not get as much recognition as malaria, but, but still it has... Globally, it has tremendous impact. So it's not a, it seems real esoteric and like maybe it's just something that you and I talk about here in International Health Forum and you, maybe your initial impression is, why are we talking about this? But it's, it's huge. Um, it's it's a, a global uh, uh, disease and it uh, has a significant impact. Um, this is, I uh, just, uh, Joe, this was, um, the uh, cancer of schistosomiasis, you can see that sign um, right above there. You see a schistosomiasis research uh, training center. Uh, but this is a really an impressive campus. There was unfortunately really um, badly destroyed uh, by um, Hyann or Yolanda. But uh, this was, uh, I'm, I'm right at the, we were uh, helping clean out this uh, laboratory. But there was just uh, years and years and years of work that's been done here um, in the uh, study of japonicum. In fact, um, that, that, that room in there was just, I mean, the whole roof was taken off. Um, I mean, it was so sad because it really, it looked like something out of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark or something like the 1940s. It had microscopes and but all the text, incredibly thick text, many of them were written right here in this uh, uh, institution and, and a lot of it was, uh, like I said, significantly damaged or destroyed uh, by this storm. So, um, uh, a lot of history was lost there. They even, in fact, they had a room full of um, uh, mice um, that uh, were harbingers of the uh, antigen uh, for schistosomes that they did a lot of their, their study with. And uh, they, unfortunately, were all lost uh, in the storm. So they uh, really were uh, impacted severely uh, by um, Typhoon Hyena. So we've uh, talked quite a bit about this already, but um, there's, there's actually... Um, there's the three main kind, uh, the, so the three major subtypes are Schistosoma japonicum, which, uh, as we've talked about, it, uh, are in the Philippines, but they occur only in Asia. 
they're especially seen in China as well as the Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. Uh, and then the other two uh, major subtypes are Schistosoma mansani, which predominantly uh, infects the, uh, the large intestine, which we'll see in a second, and then hematobium, again, predominantly infects the bladder uh, or the, the uh, GU system, such as the ureters, the kidneys, and the bladder. And then there's also two minor subtypes that we'll just mention for completeness sake. There's uh, uh, intercalatum, uh, which is often associated with mansani, as they both predominantly infect the colon. And then uh, makangi is quite a bit like uh, um, japonicum, uh, it infects the uh, intestine, the small intestine. Here's just another uh, chart that I made out just to give you an idea of, uh, of uh, where they reside and the um, morbidity they're associated with. You can see the left side there under intestinal and hepatic um, uh, uh, problems. That would be japonicum and mansani. Uh, both of them can cause liver failure, and they both, uh, as I've already mentioned, infect the, the um, small and large intestine respectively. Um, but also the minor subtypes, uh, intercalatum and macondi, also infect, can infect the, uh, the liver and the intestine. And then the uh, exclusively hematobium is the only one that really uh, impacts the, uh, the bladder. Here's just, a, again, this is maybe a little more poignant way of, of uh, show, showing you illustratively uh, just the worldwide, the global impact of this disease. Um, let's see if I, I'm testing my 50-year-old eyes here. Um, uh, this um, is the global distribution of schistosomiasis in the red, which you can see is predominantly in uh, Africa, and it looks like uh, Yemen there in the uh, uh, Saudi Arabian Peninsula there, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, in the red there, that's where there is really no control at this time of schistosomiasis. So, They've not been successful where they have not implemented any kind of programs for eradication. And then if you'll see, though, in the yellow bill, uh, I guess that would be predominantly in South America, then you see Brazil. Um, and, uh, and then uh, you'll see over um, in Asia there, and then uh, I guess that's uh, in Egypt as well. That's where they have large-scale uh, control programs um, that are at least partially successful. And and I believe, yeah, the Philippines are, are also in yellow there, so we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then finally, uh, in green, it's uh, at uh, regions of the world, you can see there in the, uh, it looks like Venezuela perhaps, and then uh, in the northern uh, part of Africa, and, and then in Saudi Arabia, um, that's where uh, the disease has been virtually eradicated. So there are programs that you can implement um, that are very, very successful in uh, at least partial eradication of this disease, um, which is important to talk about with regard to um, public health uh, implications. So just real quickly, we'll go there in just a minute. I'll just talk a little bit more about the pathogenesis. As I said, the big culprit is not the worms themselves. They, they really don't cause, usually don't cause a big problem. It's the eggs. And they stimulate a very, uh, a very robust immune response um, that causes the problem. The eggs are released in the bloodstream by the adult worms, which invade local tissues and then cause inflammation, and then gradually this granulomatous reaction, which causes scarring and fibrosis. Japonicum uh, flukes, uh, these parasites, release eggs that are often deposited into the small intestine and to the liver, which uh, we've mentioned. Um, here I, uh, I just want to um, say hats off uh, to our U.S. military. Um, they were just incredibly accommodating and helpful when we first arrived in the uh, Philippines. This was uh, shortly after we arrived. Um, I was a little bit short of manpower, and so I called on my military friends here, and they were, again, very inco uh, accommodating. They're very good at setting up field hospital tents, and so uh, they came over. Um, uh, and uh, they spent the whole day with us uh, setting up our field hospital, and so they are to be applauded, and, uh, um, yeah, we don't recognize them enough. So uh, You can see we're just all around us. You can see we're drenched. Um, that's partly from sweat, but partly from water, so I guess I should be tested. Um, and you can just see at our feet there, though, it, it, it's um, glistening with water, and then just behind us, 
Uh, you can't see it, but that was actually a tennis court, and it really it looked like a pond. It was uh, when we first arrived there; it was several feet deep of water, and I was in there, in and out of there, a number of times. So, as were many people, unfortunately. And um, Tom keeps reminding us that these, again, it's not a, a, a even a very casual contact with the water. They can um, uh, penetrate the skin in seconds. In fact. Why don't you tell, uh, tell us what uh, Dr. Agnes, wasn't it Dr. Agnes that yeah. um, made a comment about uh, uh, the um, transmission of schistosomiasis? She just said that very fast, and she also said that, uh, you know, when, uh, that um, post-flooding in uh, that particular area of Leyte, uh, that the exposure was 100%, which means, you know, that that Parasite is there in abundance, and you know. And so, once the flood it comes, and the cercaria go everywhere, and then everybody is exposed. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's it's something to be taken seriously. Um, then uh, this the part is uh, I've already alluded to a lot of this, but uh, with intestinal schistosomiasis, again, you can see abdominal pain, weight loss, again, it's associated with malnutrition, so they'll lose weight. Um, they have ulceration from the uh, chronic exposure uh, of these um, flukes attached to uh, the, uh, uh, the circulation of the uh, intestine. There's iron deficiency anemia. They can be associated with colon polyps, uh, I think especially Mansani, uh, which is, uh, resides in the large intestine. You'll see colonic polyps with Mansani. And then uh, even at times you can even get uh, substantial scarring and bowel obstruction. So that's something to consider. And then with uh, liver disease, you certainly, even with Keiteyama fever, uh, that's we're asking about that, I, did, I failed to mention, even with that, you can get enlargement of the liver and spleen. And certainly these persons with uh, chronic infection, they, they get uh, hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and I already mentioned that simmering pipe stem fibrosis, and that's the scarring process that occurs in the liver. The eggs lodge in the portal venous system, causing blockage of the venous blood flow, causing secondary portal venous hypertension, leading to uh, ascites and esophageal varices. So um, apparently because of their success and their um, uh, eradication uh, of this disease, they don't see nearly as much of it, but we still, we saw a number of patients with prominent ascites while we were there, and again, a lot of these patients with this incredibly enormous uh, uh, lower extremity varicosities, and that's certainly from schistosomiasis. Um, I, I already, uh, I don't need to comment anymore on this. I want to comment about the neurological complications and then pulmonary complications. Uh, and then the, here's a, just uh, pictures, uh, very graphic and telling. That picture's worth a thousand words, but uh, all these uh, um, patients uh, are suffering from uh, liver disease from shift to some eyes. And so you can imagine just seeing that, it shows you the morbidity. I mean, this is a horrible, uh, it can be a horrible problem. I mean, how sad is that? It's tragic to see children uh, like that that are, I mean, they're incapacitated. They, they have no reserve. Um, they can't uh, function very well daily. And then those are those uh, varicosities I was telling you about, very prominent. So it's not, you know, little varicose vein. It's, it's pretty obvious. Um, that actually is a picture of, um, uh, yes, uh, I can't remember, Sonny, I guess I'm no, sorry. That one seemed to tell me, I'm sorry. You're right, I didn't seem to tell you, I'm sorry, yeah. side spike. Yeah, it's got a side spike, uh, that's how you know. Um, the, um, that's, uh, with the uh, japonicum, it also, they allude to a, a sort of a, 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 a spike, but it's really more of a bump, and oftentimes you won't even see it at all. Uh, but you'll just see inside, you'll see a, um, a mericidia um, that's enfolded in this, um, in this oval-shaped uh, egg. So that's essentially uh, what you see when you uh, do these um, uh, stool studies. And then this is just an example of uh, inflammation uh, surrounding an, an egg that's been deposited in the tissue there. That's what it looks like pathologically. You can do, uh, sometimes um, if the diagnosis uh, is elusive, they can do a rectal biopsy with a pretty high yield, um, and they often the eggs will be implanted there. 
there is a good picture of the swimmer's itch, um, the rash that we uh, described to you. And so very uh, pruritic, very itchy, and uh, so you'll just see these uh, isolated red dots. Sometimes if it's a uh, high concentration of infection, there'll be multiple dots. But, uh, um, and Tom, as he mentioned too, there's also a, 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 ver a bird version, avian schistosomiasis, and that's the, um, fortunately, it doesn't have sufficient enzymes, uh, the, the, um, uh, the larva, to penetrate much beyond the skin, so that's all it does is it causes a rash like that. So if you go swimming and you get a rash much like that, think about avian schistosomiasis, which is pretty ubiquitous. I think it's pretty common. So we were, yeah. Uh, Finally, here's uh, that Keiteyama fever that we were talking about. It's a hypersensitivity reaction. It's like a serum sickness, as I said, and um, it occurs two to eight weeks after exposure. Uh, again, fever, headache, um, a lot like the flu, muscle aches, joint aches, dry cough, diarrhea, no catanopia, and large in the liver and spleen. And it usually does resolve after several weeks. But if you do get a high enough burden, it can cause demise. Um, one thing I have not mentioned yet, but this is a really uh, a poor man's test for schistosomiasis. It's not specific, but it is, rel I guess, relatively sensitive uh, it, uh, to any parasite infection. Uh, it's eosinophilia. So if you do a CBC with a differential, they'll have a very, uh, oftentimes, about 50% of the time, up to 50% of the time, they'll have a high eosinophil count. They can have patchy infiltrate from uh, egg deposition in the lungs. Um, Eggs, like especially like with um, expatriates like ourselves, you rarely will see them in the stool. Um, and at least uh, early on, the antibody test will be uh, can be negative. I've really talked about the predominant problem is the immune response, and uh, again, for emphasis sake, the majority of persons are asymptomatic. <coughs> The manifestations of chronic disease, we've already uh, really addressed this too. It really depends on what the subspecies is, whether it infects your, your liver, your intestines, uh, your bladder, uh, your lungs. It depends on the subtype. Um, in terms of diagnosis, um, and that's really very relevant to us uh, with International Health Forum, uh, of course, the first thing you want to get the most powerful tool is the clinical history. Are you traveling to an endemic area? And indeed, in this case, we were. We went to the Philippines, and it was very, very endemic for uh, japonicum. And then you want to inquire about the signs and symptoms, which we already discussed. <clears throat> you can um, do a stool study, and uh, the uh, schistosomiasis research and control, or control and research hospital were very good at performing this stool concentration test called a keto cat. <laughs> that is a much more effective test for people that are chronically infected um, with schistosomiasis because they're going to have a very high egg burden uh, in the feces. But again, uh, expats or, or, uh, or travelers, uh, that's going to be a very low yield. Um, they also do a test that uh, I don't know a lot about called a comp test, um, which um, not even going to really discuss. But um, for our purposes, the, uh, what's important um, to discuss is um, <clears throat> what I recommend is so like if you do, as a traveler or an expat, if you do travel to the Philippines, um, you should wait about eight weeks after return. And then what we would recommend is number one is that you get a, 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 a if you didn't have exposure to fresh water, you should get a CDC with a differential to see if you have that high eosinophil count. And then also, um, you can ask your doctor to do an, uh, an antibody test for uh, schistosomiasis. Uh, and again, I'd wait about eight weeks uh, upon your return to allow your body time to uh, produce that antibody. Um, if that's positive, if you're suspicious uh, for schistosomiasis, then I would recommend treatment, uh, which we'll discuss in just a second. The treatment has very uh, uh, small side effects, uh, side effect profile. So uh, <clears throat> the literature really encourages you if you even have a, it's a moderate uh, degree of suspicion to err on the side of treatment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so with regard to treatment, the drug of choice universally is prosequantil. Um, with hematobium, mansonium, and intercalatum, 
you only need 40 milligrams per kilogram of the drug uh, divided in one to two doses. With uh, japonicum or makangi, it's more difficult to eradicate, and so they recommend a higher concentration at 60 milligrams per kilogram um, in two or three doses that are divided at least three hours apart. So that's just a one-time, like... Yeah. It is, but like in the Philippines, they had patients with chronic schistosomiasis, and they would bring them back about every six to, uh, weeks to three months, um, and that's uh, for twofold. Um, one, it is incredibly effective at eradicating it, but they keep getting re, uh, reinfected, reinfected, and so um, they would bring them uh, back, uh, as I said, about every three months. They had a, uh, a clinic uh, for their uh, patients with chronic schistosomiasis. There is a, a uh, there is a a, um, a role uh, for uh, for excuse me for glucocorticoids for steroids in treatment of schistosomiasis. It's really in uh, two particular scenarios. One is Kaseyama fever. Again, it's it's a, a really uh, powerfully a very strong potent uh, immune response. And so with Kaseyama fever, they do recommend that you use steroids initially, and they actually recommend that you delay use of prazoquazole until the, um, uh, I guess, the, um, the parasites uh, become more uh, mature because they're much more responsive to uh, the drug, probably quantile. And then also in neurological schistosomiasis, um, the treatment with probably quantile can also cause uh, significant inflammation in the uh, uh, brain tissue, and uh, with that, they also recommend steroids. How far advanced would they that they treat patients, I mean, if they have massive ascites. Yeah, there is a point of no return. So they actually, there is definitely studies that actually does show some regression. They even said of fibrosis, and but it's to a limited degree. If you have patients like, for example, I showed you those pictures of those children, uh, my strong suspicion is that uh, there's certainly a lot of that is irreversible because it, it's scar tissue is basically it's a granulomous reaction. So at some point, if you don't treat it early enough, it, it, there is some component that's irreversible. Um, mass campaigns, again, are, are proved to be very, very successful. Um, in communities that uh, have endemic schistosomiasis, they do, they have a big uh, public health outreach where they um, uh, they uh, treat everybody on an annual basis with a dose of uh, prosequantil. And again, the side effect profile is pretty minimal, and so it's really very, very beneficial. They've had tremendous um, uh, reductions in, in chronic morbidity and, and mortality because of these, um, uh, these public health uh, measures. Is there any, uh, you know, like with malaria, you can have preventative care, like when you go in, you'll take Valor out, like prophylaxis. Do they ever do that for schistosomiasis? For, like, I would imagine you would have high exposure. If you're going to a typhoon area, it's pretty hard to avoid yeah. touching water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're, they don't do the, the prophylaxis there because the this drug is largely ineffective against the larval stages. So, okay. you know, for, against the circarius, so shortly after it's penetrated, all the way till it makes its way through the lungs, so that this drug is not very effective. Yeah. Okay. And it's so you only really against wait. the adults, so you wait. Yeah. Okay. That's tough. How long do you wait? Uh, yeah. Three months. Eight, so six to eight weeks. So yeah, Lance shouldn't worry about it for another month or so. No, he should, have, he should start worrying about it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got back in mid-December. So yeah, it's it's time. So I need to. Yeah, we uh, have, we have developed a protocol which will go out in the mail this week to all the people who were in the Philippines as a response. Uh, which is advising them of their possible exposure and giving them the means to get themselves tested. Uh, there's only one place to do the serology test in the United States, and that's because you need the antigen, and the antigen is, you know, the, the Schistosomiasis Control Research Hospital. That was their main, fun one of their main functions was producing that antigen for tests. Uh, here in the United States, it's the CDC laboratory in Atlanta maintains a colony, and they do the tests. And you have to go all the way to Atlanta? Today. No, we take the blood sample that are standard laboratory, spin it down, and send the serum in. Serum can go at room temperature. And, but CDC, of course, has been a federal agency, has got this complicated form you have to fill out to accompany their specimens. Of course. That's right. Yeah, I don't know what the time, turnaround time is on the results from that. 
but uh, you know, we'll, we're going to find out real soon. And then, the, of course, praziquantel is not readily available in the United States, uh, and so it has to be special ordered uh, through your physician or, you know, and so treatment, once we have diagnosed positive, then the, the physician's going to have to follow through with trying to, you know, or the pharmacist with trying to get their hands on that, that medication. We should have done that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a ton cheaper too. Yeah, yeah. 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 we would have to smuggle it in. <laughs> That's okay. done before. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I am going to end our recording here.